George, the expansion of the universe is one of the most remarkable achievements in human understanding in terms of what we have, uh, what we can perceive of what reality is all about. From your work, how can we take these, these theories and, and really put them into a, a modern uh, confidence that the observations indeed are consistent with these remarkable theories? Well, we already took from uh, granted that the universe was expanding from Hubble and Slipher's work in the early days. And uh, just everything you see shows that the universe is expanding. What we did was go ahead and show that the expansion by our observations, by looking over such great distances and with such precision, that the expansion is extraordinarily uniform in all directions. And so that's one of the consistency. It's fitting the whole model together and seeing how things fit that gives you other confidence in it. But the other thing that we do is we use the radiation itself as a probe, not only of the geometry and the age of the universe, but also of its contents and how it fits together. And so we think something like inflation caused the universe to start expanding. We now have a, a new component emerging in the universe, the dark energy that's causing it to accelerate the expansion. So we went through this period of accelerating expansion during inflation. We went with this period of slowing when large scale structure formed and we see the results of galaxies and clusters of galaxies, solar systems and so forth. And now the universe is starting to expand uh, Even at, faster. A, at a faster rate. And so all this fits together in an incredibly well knit, well described, situation that is you put together this simple model and you look at the universe and you that's what you get right and it's a fascinating a picture of a of a a, a, a rich com expansion it's not just a simple expansion it's a inflation enormously ge geometric expansion for a while and then it's slowing because of gravity right. the structures forming and now an accelerating but all of this is backed up by real right. data right it is and I, I sort of think of it as an analogy in the following suppose you have like a ball or something, you put it in your slingshot. You stretch the slingshot and you let it go. It gets accelerated by the force of the slingshot. That's right. like inflation. Right. Then it's on this coasting trajectory up like a big parabola. Yeah, that's and cool. that's cool. And, you know, galaxies form and all, everything looks good. And then suddenly it starts lifting off and going up again, up again, right? You know, instead of curling down and slowing down, it starts speeding up. <laughs> and so, whoops, where is the slingshot now, right? And, and so, it's rich, but it, it it also makes things work because that acceleration means that the beginning of the universe was further back than we thought, and therefore there was more time for the galaxies to form. And it was a tight schedule, you know, to get everything <laughs> made the way it is now. And so it, it's not just that it makes a pretty picture, but it actually allows you to develop these ideas and, and understand it. And so I think that combination of the fact that we see this type of, and that we see that the universe is flat and we also see from looking at the fluctuations in the radiation in the form of the structure that matter, that is the ordinary matter we made out of and the, and the dark matter, together only make up about 27% of the universe. And that 70% of the universe, roughly, is made of this dark energy that's causing. Yeah. All that fits together in a, in a complicated way. And we can tell that from the radiation. We can tell how much matter there is and, and so forth. And the primary radiation that you work with is the cosmic yes. microwave right. background the, radiation right. that comes from the totality of the universe. Right. In, it's in the direction. relic radiation from the Big Bang. It fills all the space and time. We're just bathed in it. And, <laughs> and uh, occasionally we get to snag some of them and learn some <laughs> secrets of the universe. <laughs> now, uh, you, uh, by, by looking at the, the uh, microwave background radiation, you mentioned that the universe is flat. Now, that gives us a sense of geometry. Now, it right. didn't have to be flat. It, it, according to Einstein, the universe could be curved, and it could be curved uh, in such a way that it closes upon itself. Right. Call it, or, could, or it could be where it opens forever. Like a like saddle. A, like a saddle or like a funnel that goes right, outwards, right, right. you know, continuously going out. Though, so you had a choice of closed, flat, or open. And we see the universe is very close to flat. And in our simple understanding of the relationship between the contents of the universe and the curvature of the universe, that means the total contents of the universe has to be just the right amount to make it flat. If there was too little, it would be open. If there's too much, it would be closed. Right. Based it's on the weird. gravity. So we have a just right universe, right. <laughs> just enough material, just based on the interaction between space time itself and the contents of space and time. So, you know, they each interact upon each other and, and, and this model, and that's the view. So we either have to 
to discover this and understand how this works, or we have to modify Einstein's gravity, and it's very difficult to do that. Right, so we're happy to have the results come as, as it does. Uh, it it's, it's comes in very beautifully. It's sort of, in the early days of Hubble, they had the distances wrong, and they thought the age of the universe was less than the age of the Earth, and that was causing heartburn. And, <laughs> and then later, the scales got more correct. But then we had a problem up until a f you know, few years ago that the universe was just a little younger than the oldest stars in it. And now, because we see the universe is accelerating, that means... It wasn't expanding so fast in the past, so it was going slower, so it's longer back to the beginning. There's plenty of time for the stars and the galaxies to form. And the picture that you see from the cosmic uh, microwave background, uh, doesn't that give additional confidence that a lot of these other theories from other different kinds of observations are consistent? So it's not just one piece of data that's read in five right. different, that supports five different theories, but it's, it's a different observations, different technologies right. that support the same theory. Right. So there are many different observations that do that. The cosmic microwave background, the relic radiation, is very key because it's more than it's much, many more pieces of information. It's not just one piece of information saying the universe was hot or the universe is uniform. There's a lot of extra fluctuations. So you see this rich spectrum, right? It's, you see, it's like taking a, a image of the sun and dispersing it. You know, it's, you see this nice color, but then if you look carefully, there's these little lines and you can say, oh, there's helium. That's oh, how helium was discovered. Oh, oh. oh there's calcium. Oh, oh. you know, there's right, all these right, different, right. All, you can start seeing all these different components of the universe in there because you see this extra information. Right. And this, and the cosmic microwave background provides a lot of this extra information and it helps tie the pieces together. And many times we have several pieces of evidence pointing to the same thing. So the fact that we know the kind of primordial, you know, if you look at really old stars that are made from primordial material, they have a certain number of light elements and no heavier elements in it. And you can look at the ratios. That tells you how much ordinary matter there was in the early universe. The cosmic microwave background, based on atomic physics instead of the nuclear physics, also tells you a number. And then you can go out and look now. All three epochs give you the same amount, that it's only about 4% of the universe is the ordinary matter, like what we're made out and of. And those are three completely different completely technologies. Different, different physics different epochs, you know, completely different approaches, and they give you the same answer. Oh, right. That's remarkable. Right. That's just so, so exciting. What it means is we have lots of constraints. We've gotten to the point now where not only do we have enough observations to make up a good model of the universe, but we can actually test that the things we think were going on there, like, you know, the formation of the nuclei and then the formation of the atoms and the formation of galaxies. We can check at each of those stages and see the things that were going on or what we calculate. So we have cross-checks. We're constraining it very tightly. Which gives us a very high, increasingly high confidence right. that, that our model of the universe and its creation and its genesis is, is, is accurate. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, gone, it's gone to the part where it's not just theoretical. It's something that we have cross-constraints. And what we're hoping to actually learn and understand new things about the world and the universe.